My dear friends, today is Palm Sunday. There are a number of announcements to make today with the list of all the Holy Week services. So I'll try to be as brief as I can. The Holy Thursday Mass begins at 7 p.m. There will be confessions before that. I wanted to ask you now, if you would, just to please stand for a reading from the Holy Gospel. This is a portion of the Passion of St. Matthew, chapter 27. Now, from the sixth hour, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. But about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of the bystanders on hearing this said, This man is calling on Elias. And immediately one of them ran and taking a sponge, soaked it in common wine, put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink. But the rest said, Wait, let us see whether Elias is coming to save him. But Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and gave up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth quaked and the rocks were rent and the tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep arose. Thus far the words of today's Holy Gospel. My dear friends, this Sunday I just, I know I have to be brief, and I'll just, um, I just wanted to speak to you a little bit about the suffering of our Lord, which I will continue on Good Friday. Today I'm, I'm going to just speak to you about a few little things that happened before our Lord was crucified. Hopefully that you can see that in this you, you see how divine providence was already teaching us many lessons in the passion of our Lord. Every single thing that happened has an important lesson for us to learn. And the first one I wanted to mention to you was that they came to the place that is called Golgotha. This hill, God knew from all eternity that it would be the place of his son's sacrifice. And so, tradition holds that Noah took the relics of Adam, his skull and bones, that he carried with him on the ark and he buried them in that very spot where Jesus would be crucified. And then some years later, it is said that it was on that very hill that Abraham took his son for the sacrifice that Abraham thought was going to be his son Isaac. At divine providence, guided them to do this. And it seems by the fact that the, all four evangelists mentioned Golgotha, which is a Hebrew word which means the, the place of the skull. All four evangelists mentioned, so it seems to give great credence to that tradition. And what God was doing was he was teaching us that his divine son was dying not only for the sins of the world at the time, but for all the people, past, present, and future. That he was dying for the whole human race, from Adam down to the last person who will live. And I think that in meditating on this, you can see how providence does direct everything. God is in charge. It should give you great consolation to realize that even in, even in small things, God is directing our hand as long as we are living in the state of grace and trying to do His holy will. God will guide us. Providence will take care. The soldiers then gave Jesus wine to drink mingled with gall this was for a, the purpose of numbing his senses, sort of like a, a drug, as it were, though 
you couldn't really call it a drug, but something to, to perhaps cause Jesus to, to be more at ease when they would nail him to the cross. And they were used to the prisoners throwing a fit at that moment. And so they gave him this very bitter drink. But it says in Scripture that when Jesus had tasted it, he would not drink it. He tasted it in order to suffer even in the sense of his taste, which until that moment had been untouched. But now he takes that bitterness in his mouth in order to expiate for our sins of gluttony and intemperance. So many sins in the taking of food and drink. And Jesus is also giving us an example that we should mortify our tastes in order not to be brought down by these sins. We don't often think of the fact that Gluttony is one of the capital sins. It's not one that we often think of. But Jesus was making reparation for those sins here now. But I think there's another reason that our, another thing our Lord is making reparation for, and it was the fact that he would not take this medication or 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 anesthetic, he would not take it because he did not in any way wish to lessen his suffering. And I think that our Lord is making up for all of us who are too weak to accept our crosses and sufferings. So many of us refuse to accept any pain. And so as soon as we begin to even have a slight headache, we medicate ourselves. And so, because we are so weak, Jesus is not allowing himself to have any relief in order to do more penance, in order to satisfy even for our weakness. They then did a terrible thing to our Lord. They stripped him of his garments. And as you know from the tenth station of the cross, the stripping of his garments reopened all of the wounds that he had suffered during the scourging. I think all of us can remember perhaps a time in our lives where we had a very bad cut that bled a lot and the bandage stuck to the wound. And if you remember just that little bit of pain that you had to go through when the bandage was removed, and consider the fact that sometimes when, with burn victims, they have, to, they have to knock them out in the hospitals to change their dressing because the pain would be so great. But our Lord endured this when you think about the fact that during the carrying of the cross his garments stuck to his flesh and so they were drying on his skin so that when they pulled off the garments from his shoulders all the way down his back his sores were reopened we know the pain a little bit. But Jesus offered up this pain and suffering in order to make up for our sins of the flesh, especially sins of immodesty. I don't think you realize, because I don't think any of us really understand the great modesty of our divine Lord how much suffering it was for him to be stripped 
there on that hill in front of all those people. That suffering, that humiliation that he endured, the shame that it caused him was so that we would remember the shame of our immodesty, especially immodesty in dress. And Jesus is also, by this act, consoling those who are deprived of everything. Some of you will die with nothing. And that's because our Lord wished it so for you to be more like him. He didn't even have the clothes on his back when he died. Nothing was left to him. He was stripped of everything. And he's teaching us, of course, not ever to be attached to anything in this world. Don't allow yourselves ever to worry about possessions or money or clothes. It's all going to be taken away. You will leave this world with nothing just as he did. But as I said, it's a consolation to us to remember that since Jesus was deprived of everything, that he won't forget us in that moment when even his friends abandon him. He won't forget those of you who have honored him at your moment of death. I don't have it here in front of me, but that prayer that we said after the procession here on Palm Sunday. We return from the procession, the priest goes back to the altar, and I hope that you read that prayer, which said in part that all those who took part in this procession will be granted a very special blessing and protection from the demons. Our Lord is trying to show you that he won't forget you. Those of you who honor him, especially in his passion and suffering, he will be with you in your hour of suffering. He will never abandon you. You might be deprived of everything of this world, but you will never be deprived of our Lord Jesus Christ if you stay faithful to him. My dear friends, in conclusion then, during this Holy Week, let us resolve to read slowly and devoutly the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ in order that we might recognize in it all the lessons that divine providence wishes to teach us and the examples of Jesus' virtues and goodness might be impressed upon our minds and our hearts. I hope you will join me on Good Friday when we will continue these meditations and thoughts on the passion of our Lord. May God grant you a truly blessed week. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.